We're going to get to all the news in just a minute, and there's a lot of breaking news. But before we start the show today, big announcement for you. This 4th of July weekend, you get two years of Daily Wire Plus for the price of one. That's two years of unlimited access to our uncensored, uncompromised content for the price of one year. Don't miss out. Get it right now at Daily Wire Plus. You're not going to want to miss a minute. It is an election year, and this is an insane election year, which brings us to the news. So tonight, tonight is the big night for Joe Biden. Why? Well, because his last big night was a giant flop, a huge fail. That one, of course, happened just last week, which now seems like it was 10 years ago. That is when Joe Biden went on stage with Donald Trump and physically expired on the stage. They had to bring the paddles and everything right there on the stage. It was just terrible. And he has spent the week since trying to prove that he is not, in fact, dead. He is just, in the words of Miracle Max from The Princess Bride, mostly dead. So perhaps a little bit alive. That's been his task for the last week or so. And it's not going particularly well. So over the last 48 hours, on July 4th, he went out there in the Rose Garden. He tried to give a speech. It did not go particularly well. He started babbling nonsensically about Trump and suckers and losers, which, of course, is a perfect July 4th message for the American people celebrating our 248th year of independence from Great Britain. He instead goes out there and starts rambling about suckers and losers and Trump. And he does not look good. All those plastic surgeries make him look terrible. Plus, he's really old. Plus, he is in the stage two minimum of dementia. Here is the president of the United States yesterday on July 4th. Inspiring stuff here. You know, I was in that World War I cemetery. It was a World War II cemetery. In France. And uh, in Normandy. The one that my, one of our colleagues, the former president, didn't want to go and be up there. I probably shouldn't even say it. Anyway, <laughs> we got to just remember who in the hell we are. We're the United States of America. Yeah. Yes, we are. Well, yes. <laughs> I, I like that when he says we have to remember who the hell we are, he has to take a break there to remember who we are. That's always very exciting stuff from the president. Well, on his way out of the Rose Garden, he turns to everybody and goes, I'm not going anywhere. He said as a giant hook from vaudeville came and yanked him off the stage. You got me, man. You got me, man. I'm not going anywhere. All right. All right. I'll come back out when they let the open the gate. Okay? I'll come back out when thank they you, when they you, let me you. out of my one last thing. Do, one last you know, thing. They're like, no. When no. I was a senator, there was, oh, no. there were always congestion on the highways. Oh, no. no congestion anymore. No, <laughs> we go on the highway. There's no congestion. And so what? The way they get me to stop talking, they'll say, "We just shut down all the roads, Mr. President." You're going to lose all the votes if you don't get in. But anyway, I'll be back out. What thank you, thank you, thank what? you, thank you. I love that was you. the thing he had to say. Thank you. I love that. He's like, did you see the aides coming to try to take away the microphone? They're like, we're going to take the mic away. He's like, no, I got one more thing. I'm going to traffic and on the highways and there's no traffic anymore. What? Uh, this is him reassuring people that he's not leaving. I do find it amusing that he is flanked by the defense secretary, Lloyd Austin, who literally went missing for several weeks in the middle of international crises, this this administration is just missing. They're just missing. They are the empty chair that Clint Eastwood was talking about at the 2012 Republican National Convention. Almost literally an empty chair. This man is an empty suit. He is no longer room temperature. He is actually, he is now entered into his carbon dating half-life, this president of the United States. So you got that guy. Then you got the defense secretary who goes missing for weeks on end without telling anybody. Then you have the secretary of transportation who takes a two-month paternity leave to take care of of his husband after the ravages of childbirth. And no one notices that he's gone. Then you have Kamala Harris, another empty suit and fraudster. I mean, it's just what a cavalcade of absolute intellect and people committed to the job. And this genius crew has somehow achieved a 40-year high in inflation. As you know, the cost of living is up almost 20% from 2021. Families everywhere are feeling that burden. Legacy media, along with all their other lies, continue to insist the economy is fine and it's your fault for being mad about the inflation. It's just your perception. That's the problem. They're gaslighting you as they've gaslit you about pretty much every major issue for the last 20 years. Well, let me help you find some ways to save money in this economic climate. One way to do that is by switching to Pure Talk. If you're one of many American families looking to cut down on your monthly bills, you need to start with your cell phone service. I recommend Pure Talk. It's both affordable and reliable. Pure Talk is rapidly becoming the wireless company of choice for conservatives. Plus, it's great for families because the more lines you add, the more you save. Not to mention, Pure Talk is veteran-led. Instead of funding DEI initiatives, they fund basic services for vets who've served the country. 100% of their customer service team is located right here in the United States. If you're looking for ways to save money for your family, I highly recommend switching on over to Pure Talk. 
Visit puretalk.com slash Shapiro to explore their offers. When you make the switch, you'll get an additional 50% off your very first month of service. Visit puretalk.com slash Shapiro to upgrade your cell phone service to America's most dependable 5G network. Save an extra 50% off your very first month of coverage today. That's puretalk.com slash Shapiro today. And speaking of the vice president of the United States, last night, the vice president and the president of the United States appeared on stage at a 4th of July event. And it got awkward because Kamala Harris almost called herself the president. And then Joe Biden thought it was Christmas. You think I'm kidding, but I'm not. Because that's the world in which we now live. Here we go. And we give thanks to our commander in chief, the, vi- the president Whoops. of the United States, <laughs> the extraordinary president of the United States. And Joe, Joe is Biden. just kind of like standing there awkwardly. Oh, ho, ho. Ho, ho, ho. Merry 4th of July. Happy Independence Day. Wrong holiday, Joe. I like that he forgot which which holiday he was in the middle of right there. And Kamala Harris, with the crazy smile on her face, as she realizes she almost let the cat out of the bag, that she's been actively attempting to poison Joe's soup. That Kamala Harris has been leaking nonstop to the press since all of this began because she's this, she can smell it. She's this close to the presidency. She's that close. Ooh, she, she can almost feel it. All of this culminated last night. There was a fireworks show. Joe was scared by the loud noises the same way that my dog was scared by the loud noises last night. And as he got scared by the loud noises, he reached out for a helping hand and he found Kamala. And then they awkwardly raised their hands together in a gesture that looked more like her physically attempting to keep him upright than a sign of victory. Here we go. You can see them there. Uh, they're standing there. And then he reaches out like, will you hold my hand? And then oh, look, I'm raising my hand. And Kamala's like, I don't like when he, you're holding my hand. It's awkward. I don't like it, but I'm going to smile. And then Joe's like, I, 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 look, oh, let's all point at the fire. Oh, that, that same expression you will recall from Hillary Clinton being amazed by balloons at the DNC in 2016. I do love it when politicians act amazed by things happening around them. It's really amusing. Joe Biden's like, look, it's an exploding thing. In the sky. Things are going great over at Biden HQ. And by the way, the polls suck for Joe Biden. They get worse and they get worse and they get worse. Brand new poll from the Wall Street Journal over the past 48 hours. Donald Trump has now opened a six point lead over President Biden among voters nationally. 80% say Joe Biden is too old to run for a second term. 80%. You can't get 80% of Americans to agree on the moon landing. But 80% of Americans agree that Joe Biden is too old to be president because it is more self-evident than either of the other two. Trump's lead over Biden in a two-person matchup is 48-42. It is the widest in journal surveys dating to late 2021. Trump had just a two-point lead in February. The new survey began interviewing voters two days after the debate with Trump. The new survey contains a range of signs Biden's political standing has weakened. At the same time, a small but growing number of Democrats are calling for him to withdraw as the party's nominee. Only 34% view the president in a favorable light. 63% unfavorable. Less than 40% approve of his handling of inflation, immigration, the economy, or his office overall. The survey finds widespread discontent with both candidates. Nearly half voters, 47%, say they would replace both men on the ballot if they could. 53% say they aren't enthusiastic about anyone running for president. But, but, the enthusiasm for Joe Biden is non-existent. Non-existent. 76% of Democrats say Joe Biden is too old to run this year. (laughs) Of Democrats, two-thirds of Democrats would replace Biden on the ballot with another nominee. Only 36% of Republicans say that Trump is too old. Only one-third would replace him with another nominee. Disaster area polling for Joe Biden. Meanwhile, Remington Research Group surveyed the swing states. Here are their numbers. Trump In Wisconsin, up six. Pennsylvania, Trump up five. Michigan, Trump up three. Arizona, Trump up seven. Nevada, Trump up seven. Texas, Trump up 10. Ohio, Trump up 10. Montana, Trump up 20. So those are some horrifying numbers if you're a Democrat at this point. But there's some even more bad news. Daily Mail poll came out over the last 24 hours. And it shows that Donald Trump is outpacing Joe Biden 47 to 42. That's a five-point lead. But even worse, Donald Trump is skunking Kamala Harris 49 to 38. Somehow, somehow Joe Biden found the only person more unpopular than he is to be his vice president, which is a disaster area for Democrats, all of which means everything for Joe Biden probably comes down to this interview with George Stephanopoulos tonight. So Joe Biden is not capable of doing a full press conference. He's not, which is why he has not. 
He has now wobbled out to the microphones to give four, five-minute speeches. Then he's wobbled back inside to lie down for three hours while they infuse the blood of a small child into him or hit him up with some hunter's stash or whatever it is they do in the back room to provide ministrations to the withered corpse of the president of the United States. I mean, honestly, it's sad. Now ABC News is going to try to either save him or euthanize him. That's the big curiosity factor tonight. So originally, this interview was scheduled to be aired on Sunday, and it was going to be longer than like 10 minutes. Instead, the president of the United States, apparently, is going to have an interview with George Stephanopoulos that lasts as little as 15 minutes, according to the Daily Beast. Stephanopoulos, George Stephanopoulos, the Keebler elf of American politics, he apparently is going to travel to Wisconsin today to speak with Biden as he conducts two hastily arranged campaign stops in the critical swing state. ABC announced Wednesday night parts of the taped interview would first air on Friday's edition of World News Tonight and then be followed by an 8 p.m. primetime special where it would take the place of Jeopardy Masters. It will then air again in full this week on Sunday. The Daily Beast learned behind the scenes there's a deep concern inside ABC News's upper echelon that Stephanopoulos could get as little as 15 minutes to conduct what should be a searching interview offering insight into the president's mental state. The Biden campaign denied the suggestion when questioned by the Daily Beast. A White House spokesperson said it was false. The interview will be longer. ABC is going to apparently air the full interview in primetime tonight. So the big question here is whether this is going to alleviate doubts, whether Stephanopoulos is going to try to prod Joe Biden the rest of the way just over the finish line. Now, here's the thing that's so dishonest about all of this. No one, zero people believe Joe Biden will fulfill his second term in office. No one believes this. They're not even bothering to hide that part. The only question is whether he can survive the campaign. No one believes that in the year, say, 2027, Joe Biden's going to be president of the United States. No one, literally no one believes that. That is not a thing. Everyone knows that if Joe Biden becomes the president with Kamala Harris as his running mate, Kamala Harris will be the president of the United States come 2026, probably. Minimum. Maybe 2025. So all this is, is just a place filler election for the Democrats. See if they can foist one over on the American people by sheltering the American people from the reality of the awful, inauthentic, fraudulent vice presidential candidate by pretending that Joe actually might be able to withstand the rigors for four years. No one actually thinks, I mean, is he going to last for another four hours? That's the real question here. So nobody actually thinks Joe Biden is going to survive another four years, which is just another indicator of economic uncertainty. Like what the hell is going to happen right now? That economic uncertainty is going to have some pretty dire effects on the American economy. After all, it's only faith in the American economy that keeps people using dollars as the reserve currency. Well, if there's less demand for the U.S. dollar, what exactly happens to the value? It's for reasons like this. I feel it's important to diversify at least some of your savings into gold. You can do that with the help of Birch Gold. Right now, qualifying purchases by July 31st are eligible to get a one-of-a-kind limited edition golden truth bomb. The only way to claim it, your eligibility is by texting Ben to 9898. 98. Protect your savings by diversifying away from the U.S. dollar with gold. Text Ben to 989898. Birch Gold will help you convert an old IRA or 401k into an IRA in gold for no money out of pocket. Right now, qualifying purchases will get a limited edition golden truth bomb. Text Ben to 989898 today. That's Ben to 989898 right now. And the uncertainty in the markets means you should diversify. I have diversified my investments. You should do the same. Why not talk to my friends at Birch Gold and ask all your questions? Then text Ben to 989898. 98 and get started with Birch Gold. The other question that's going to arise here is if he's really, really incompetent tonight with George Stephanopoulos, it may not be enough to remove him from the candidacy. You might have to remove him from the presidency. I mean, someone's going to have to explain to me why he's incompetent to run a campaign, but competent to run the world's largest nuclear arsenal in the middle of two hot conflicts in Ukraine and in Israel, as well as a burgeoning conflict in the South China Sea over Taiwan with China. Somebody's going to have to explain to me why he's competent to handle international affairs, but he's not competent to handle his campaign. That is a non-starter. It makes no logical sense. Biden, for his part, continues to insist that he's not, he he is now the lady from Dreamgirls. No, I'm not, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm not going. No, no, not, I'm not going to go. And then he falls over. That, that, that's where we are. Now, all the leaks are coming fast and furious. So apparently, Joe Biden did an event with key Democratic leaders over the course of the last couple of days. At this event, according to the New York Times, he told a gathering of Democratic governors he needs to get more sleep and work fewer hours. 
I don't know how it's possible. He sleeps 21 hours a day. He's like a hoot owl. He sleeps 21 hours a day. And apparently he needs to work fewer hours, which again, can you work negative hours? Is that possible? Not sure how that works. Including curtailing events after 8 p.m. Well, our enemies are now on notice that at 8.03 p.m., it is wild times, man. 8.03 p.m., you can do whatever you want. Eastern time, you watch the clock, bam, you go at 8.03. Remember that time that Hillary Clinton ran a commercial about Donald Trump in 2016, where she said, who do you want receiving the 3 a.m. phone call? Well, now the question is, who do you want receiving the 8.03 p.m. phone call? Because it ain't going to be Joe Biden. That dude's asleep in the back room. The remarks on Wednesday were a stark acknowledgement of fatigue from the 81-year-old president during a meeting intended to reassure more than two dozen of his most important supporters that he's still in command of his job and capable of mounting a robust campaign against former President Donald J. Trump. So he said he needs more rest. He said that he had too much extensive foreign travel. That's that's really the problem. That he had a cold, of course. Mm -hmm. After Governor Josh Green of Hawaii, a physician, (laughs) asked Biden questions about the status of his health, Biden replied his health was fine. Quote, it's just my brain, he added. (laughs) Uh, it's just my brain. I'm going to put this on the Biden Memorial. It'll be right next to the Lincoln Memorial. You'll have quotes from Lincoln at the Lincoln Memorial. And then you'll go next door. It'll be a picture of Joe Biden in a wheelchair. And above his chair, it will just say, it's just my brain. Engraved in the marble above him. Right next to that Jefferson Monument. It'll be it'll be next to the memorial. It's, it's going to be great. It's just my brain. I remarked that some in the room took it as a joke, including Governor Kathy Hochul of New York. At least one governor did not and was puzzled by it. General Malley Dillon said in a statement he had said, quote, all kidding aside, he was clearly making a joke. Okay, that is the worst joke you can make. If you're Joe Biden, your assistant's like, oh, no, what is it? No, it's just my brain. It's just my brain. It's going to go down in presidential history. I mean, honestly, like solids. It's just my brain. I can't believe it. So same day. Ho, ho, ho. It's just my brain. Oh, my gosh. Solid stuff. With malice towards none, with charity for all, it's just my brain. Oh, so that is one leak that came out. Then Olivia Nuzzi, who actually does some good reporting. Uh, she, uh, it, it is worth stating at this point that Olivia Nuzzi should have reported this months ago. She's a piece in New York Magazine in which now the dam has broken, all of the stories about Joe Biden's senility are gushing forth. Here is what she writes. Okay, this is disturbing at a minimum. Quote, as always with this president, the production surrounding any public appearance, even if it was semi-private, came down to timing and control. He could not spend too much time out in the wild. And the circumstances in which he could exist in such an environment with so many wobbly variables would need to be managed aggressively. The worry is not that Biden will say something overly candid or say something he didn't mean to say but that he will communicate through his appearance that he is not really there. Pool reporters often struggle with the challenge of how hard it is to hear or make sense of the president. Radio reporters do not always obtain usable audio of his remarks. Print reporters squint and strain and crane their necks trying to find the best position by which their ears may absorb the vibration of his voice in the air. Reporters scrutinize their audio recordings and read quotes to one another after the fact. Is that what he said? You heard it? In that order? You sure? Now, by the way, this has been going on for months. The question is, why now? Why did you wait until Joe Biden humiliated you by taking the entire media and pulling the chair out from under them? The media put the noose around its own neck by propagating the myth that Joe Biden was fine. And then Joe Biden proceeded to kick the chair out right from under their feet. That's why they're mad. And that's why they're hurting on him. Not because they realized he's senile, but because they realized that he had completely exposed them as conspirators in the senility. Their disclosures often followed innocent questions. Have you seen the president lately? How does he seem? Often they would answer with only silence, their eyes widening cartoonishly, their heads shaking back and forth, or with disapproving sounds. Or with a simple, not good, not good, or with an accusatory question of their own. Have you seen him? Again, this is Olivia Nuzzi from New York Magazine reporting. Olivia Nuzzi is not a staunch right-winger by any stretch of the imagination. Quote, those who encountered the president in social settings sometimes left their interactions disturbed. Longtime friends of the Biden family who spoke to me on the condition of anonymity were shocked to find that the president did not remember their names. At a White House event last year, a guest recalled with horror, realizing that the president would not be able to stay for the reception because it was clear he would not be able to make it through the reception. The guest wasn't sure they could vote for Biden since the guest was now open to the idea that they had previously dismissed as right-wing propaganda. The president may not really be the acting president after all. 
Saying hello to one Democratic megadonor and family friend at the White House recently, the president stared blankly and nodded his head. The first lady intervenes, whisper in her husband's ear, telling him to say hello to the donor by name and to thank them for their recent generosity. The president repeated the words his wife had fed him. It hasn't been good for a long time, but it's gotten so, so much worse. A witness to the exchange told me so much worse. Okay, so here's the thing. Olivia Nuzzi reports this was true back in 2020. Quote, a campaign trail is a grueling exercise for anybody of any age, from the youngest network embeds to the oldest would-be president. And back then, there were days when Biden appeared sharper than on others. I knew it was a good day when he saw me and winked. On such occasions, he joked and prayed and cried with voters. He stayed to take a photo with every supporter. He might even entertain a question or two from the press. He had color in his face. There was no question he was alive and present. On bad days, which were unpredictable but reliably occurred during a challenging news cycle, he was less animated. He stared off. He did not make eye contact. He would trip over his words, even if they were programmed in a teleprompter. On such occasions, he was hurried out of the venue quickly and ushered into a waiting SUV. That's 2020. It is now 2024. So that's four years ago. Now, here's the story that's making the rounds. This is truly a, this is from April. Now, the question is why Olivia Nuzzi and the rest of the media did not report this in, you know, April. Like, why? Please explain. It's not merely that Joe Biden, of course, is senile. It's that he has presided over a terrible presidency with social unrest all over the place. Well, this may be one reason why you want to think of interesting and smart options to protect yourself and your family. Introducing the Burna Less Lethal Pistol Launcher, developed by a team of common sense gun owners who understand the importance of having choices. They engineered the Burna Launcher as a powerful tool for self-defense, allowing users to de-escalate threatening situations without having to resort to deadly force. Now, as you know, I own a lot of guns. I like four pistols. I have an AR. I have a shotgun. But let's be real. The thought of using lethal force in my home, that's a scary thing. Now, Let's also be clear, if somebody invades my home, I will shoot them. But the reality is that if there is a safer, more sensible alternative that could potentially save some lives, the Burna, then that's a great option as well. And it's particularly great because God forbid you want, you don't want to make a mistake. Somebody's clanking around in your kitchen, it's the middle of the night, you don't know exactly who it is. Well, I mean, the Burna might be a better option. The Burna is an indispensable tool to keep you and your family safe. It's legal in all 50 states. No background checks or permits required. They've received over 15,000 four and a half star reviews. Hand assembled in Fort Wayne, Indiana, Burna can ship directly to your door. It's not just an option. It's an essential component of responsible, non-lethal protection. Visit Burna.com slash Ben for 10% off your purchase. That's B-Y-R-N-A dot com slash Ben. And to check out the latest news about Burna, that's B-Y-R-N-A. Quote, in the basement, I smiled and said hello. Jill looked back at me with a confused, panicked expression. It was as if she had just received horrible news and was about to run out of the room and into some kind of a family emergency. A uh, hi, she said. Then she glanced over to her right. Oh, I had not seen the president up close in some time. I had skipped this season's holiday parties and, preoccupied with covering Trump's legal and political dramas, I hadn't been showing up at his White House. Oh, my Trump, he wasn't very accessible to the press anyway. Why bother? Biden had done a few interviews. He wasn't prone to interrupting his schedule with a surprise media circus in the Oval Office. He kept a tight circle of the same close advisors who had been advising him for more than 30 years. So unlike with his predecessor, he didn't need to hang around in West Wing hallways to figure out who was speaking to him. It was all pretty locked down and predictable in terms of the reality you could access as a member of the press with a White House hard pass. I followed the First Lady's gaze and found the president. Now I understood her panicked expression. Up close, the president does not look quite plausible. It's not that he's old. We all know what old looks like. Bernie Sanders is old. Mitch McConnell is old. Most of the ruling class is old. The president was something stranger, something not of this earth. <laughs> this was true even in 2020. His face then had an uncanny valley quality that injectable aficionados call low trust, if only by millimeters. His cosmetically altered proportions knocked his overall facial harmony into the realm of the improbable. Now here, she's sort of casually breaking the kind of media cone of silence around the fact that Joe Biden has had a ton of plastic surgery and looks awful, which of course we all know. Right? His, his hairline has receded to the back of his head. His eyes no longer open properly. He can barely move his mouth. If you look at a picture of Joe Biden from 1998 and you look at a picture of Joe Biden now, they're not even recognizably the same person. That's how much plastic surgery that dude has had done. The bad hair plugs, the whole deal. As Olivia Nuzzi writes, his thin skin, long a figurative problem and now a literal one, was pulled tightly over cheeks that seemed to vary month to month in volume. Under artificial light and in the sunshine, he took on an unnatural gleam. He looked, well, inflated. His eyes were half shut or open very wide. They appeared darker than they once had. His pupils dilated. He did not blink at regular intervals. The White House often did not engage when questioned about the president's stare, which sometimes raised alarm on social media when documented in official videos produced by the White House. The administration was above conspiratorial chit-chat that entertained seriously scenarios in which the president was suffering from a shocking decline most Americans were not seeing. If the president was being portrayed that way, it was by his political enemies on the right who promoted through what the press office termed cheap fakes, a caricature of an adult creature unfit to serve. 
They would not dignify those people or people doing the bidding of those people with a response. For many inclined to support the president, this was good enough. They did not need to monitor the president's public appearance because under his leadership, the country had returned to the kind of normal state in which members of a first world democratic society had the privilege to forget about the president for hours or days or even weeks at a time. Trump required constant observation. What did he just do? What would he do next? Oh God, what was he doing right at that moment? Biden could be trusted to perform the duties of his office out of sight. Many people were content to look away. What she doesn't say here is that the entire media were content to look away. Then she continues with her story of meeting Joe Biden again for the first time in a while. Quote, my heart stopped as I extended my hand to greet the president. I tried to make eye contact, but it was like his eyes, though open, were not on. His face had a waxy quality. He smiled. It was a sweet smile. It made me sad in a way I can't fully convey. I always thought and I wrote that he was a decent man. That's not true, but, but, but OK. If ambition was his only sin, and it seemed to me to be, he had committed no sin at all by the standards of most politicians I had covered. He took my hand in his. I was startled by how it felt. Not cold, but cool. The basement was so warm, people were sweating and complaining they were sweating. This was a silly black tie affair. I said, hello. His sweet smile stayed frozen. He spoke very slowly and in a very soft voice. And what's your name? He asked. Exiting the room after the photo, the group of reporters, not instigated by me, I should note, made guesses about how dead he appeared to be. Percentage-wise, 40% one of them asked. It was a bad night. That's the spin from the White House and its allies about Thursday's debate. But when I watched the president amble stiffly across the stage, my first thought was, he doesn't look so bad. For months, everything I had heard, plus some of what I had seen, led me to brace for something much more dire. Okay, but here's the thing. It was something much more dire, as she says. If those are all the leaks that are coming out. Vice President Harris has been joining national security phone calls. Now, let me explain. The vice president has very little role at the White House, typically speaking. He doesn't join calls with the president. He's usually not around. Famously, when Dwight D. Eisenhower, who, again, was another older president who actually suffered a heart attack in the late stages of his presidency, when he had Vice President Richard Nixon as his VP and Nixon was running for the presidency, he was once asked what major input Nixon had had on his presidency, and he couldn't come up with any. That's fairly normal. The VP usually doesn't have all that much say in policy at the White House. Vice President Harris has been sitting in on national security phone calls. This is all rather disquieting. So you got Kamala Harris on these foreign policy phone calls. All foreign leaders have to think, my God, these people, they're so stupid. They're so unbelievably stupid. But you know what's not stupid? Getting life insurance. Getting life insurance will give you peace of mind knowing if something were to happen to you, your family could cover their expenses while getting back on their feet. Policy Genius is the country's leading online insurance marketplace. It makes choosing the right policy for your family easy and quick. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies starting at just 292 bucks per year for a million dollars in coverage. Some options are 100% online and let you avoid those unnecessary medical exams. Policy Genius has licensed award-winning agents and technology that make it easy to compare life insurance quotes from America's top insurers and find that lowest price. Their team of licensed experts is on hand to help you through the process. Even if you already have a life insurance policy through work, it might not offer enough protection for your family's needs. It might not follow you if you leave your job. Policy Genius works for you, not the insurance companies. That means they don't have the incentive to recommend one insurer over another. Save time, save money, provide your family with a financial safety net using Policy Genius. Head on over to policygenius.com slash Shapiro, get your free life insurance quotes, see how much you could save. That's policygenius.com slash Shapiro. It's just the smart, responsible thing to do. Make sure your family is taken care of in case, God forbid, something happens to you. Head over to policygenius.com slash Shapiro today. Meanwhile, the White House has been lying about his need for a doctor or non-need for a doctor. Just last week, Karine Jean-Pierre, she came out and uh, she said that Joe Biden didn't need a doctor after the debate the other night. How is the president's health today? Is, does he still have his cold or is he feeling better? I, and then yeah. to clarify yeah. on the medical exam, because you said he hasn't had one since his last physical. He was on the way to the debate. The doctor was with him. Yeah. He had a cold. He's 81. Does he not get checked out by the doctor? I'm just sure <laughs> I can tell you works. he, did not, have, he get, did not get checked out by the doctor. It's a cold, guys. It's a cold. And I know that... Uh, it affects everybody differently. We have all had colds. Uh, and so, no, he was not checked by the doctor. Well, it turns out that that was a lie. According to CNN, President Joe Biden was examined by his physician in the days following last week's CNN presidential debate. The White House tells CNN. Several days later, the president was seen to check on his cold and was recovering well, White House spokesman Andrew Bates said. So again, they can't even keep their story straight at the White House. Also, Karine Jean-Pierre, man, the wages of DEI, they are extraordinary. Whether you're talking about the vice president, who's even less popular than our no longer sentient president, or whether you're talking about the press secretary, who is hired because she's black and gay and is awful at her job and thus unremovable. Turns out DEI, real bad hiring strategy. Now, the media have sort of broken down into two groups. They're sort of hedging their bets. There are some media who are attempting to still play forward the possibility that Joe Biden's going to be the nominee. And then there are others who are turning on him. 
And the split in the media is driven by two factors. One, the media have to retain the lie that they are actually objective. So they somehow have to cover for the fact that for several years, they covered up the president's senility. They have to, they have to cover that up. So the way they do that, they have to cover up the cover up. So the way they do that is by pretending they are super duper duper shocked by what they are seeing from Joe Biden right now. You can see this in the cover of The Economist. So The Economist magazine put out a cover that says no way to run a country and it is a picture of a walker with the presidential seal on it. Now like Walker, Texas Ranger, like a walker that an old person would use with the presidential seal on it. Meanwhile, The Washington Post wrote an entire editorial from the editorial board fantasizing about Joe Biden stepping down writing a fake speech for him. Quote, my fellow Americans, today we celebrate not just the birth of our nation, but the life it has lived. How have we lasted this long? How have we endured, grown, prospered? Our extraordinary framers were steered by a revolutionary premise. Our union would never be perfect. We would not be governed by an all-powerful king or sovereign. Over the past few days, I've been reflecting on all this. My season of service is nearing its close. This is a hard truth to face, but it is the natural course of things, as evident as the progression from spring to summer, from fall to winter. That is why I have decided to withdraw from the campaign for president of the United States. A large part of me wants to stay in the fight, but at this moment, the nation needs something I cannot provide, a leader with the energy to run a vigorous campaign and then to work for America at all hours for the next four years. Okay, so they're now writing fantasy editorials, like speeches, they're trying to shove it in Joe Biden's open mouth, his slack-drawn mouth, trying to shove that speech in there, hoping he'll regurgitate it back out and resign. Meanwhile, the Boston Globe editorial board is calling for Joe Biden to step down. Quote, in the days since last week's presidential debate, President Biden's team has said little that adequately explains why his performance was historically bad beyond that he had a cold. What we mostly heard instead was the closing of ranks around a beleaguered and wounded candidate. The nation's confidence has been shaken, says the Boston Globe. A bevy of potential candidates, from VP Kamala Harris to the governors of Michigan, Pennsylvania, and California, to name only a partial list, are waiting in the wings to take on Trump. All they need is for Biden to graciously bow out of the race and free his delegates to cast their votes for someone else at the Democratic National Convention. Meanwhile, James Carville is going even further. Carville, who, again, is the person who steered Bill Clinton into the White House and kept him there. He apparently is now urging major Democratic donors panicked about Joe Biden to stop contributing to the campaigns of candidates who back him. It's like a secondary boycott. So if you're a candidate who backs Joe Biden, they're saying you should call up those candidates and tell them you are not going to support them unless they tell Joe Biden to step down. Carville told all these people on a conference call that voters are itching for an alternative to Joe Biden. He said, what I would say is if we don't do something about this, I'm going to put you on call block on my cell phone. He says, maybe you look back on this and say, this is the best thing that ever happened to us. If this would have happened on October 5th, we'd be more than bruised, screwed and tattooed. Maybe this will set it into motion something different. Meanwhile, major Democratic donors are, in fact, listening to Carville, according to The New York Times. After several days of quiet griping and hoping President Biden would abandon his reelect campaign on his own, many wealthy Democratic donors are trying to take matters into their own hands. Wielding their fortunes as both carrot and stick, donors have undertaken a number of initiatives to pressure Biden to step down from the top of the ticket and help lay the groundwork for an alternative candidate. And donors are freaking out, as they should. A group of them is working to raise as much as $100 million for a sort of escrow fund called the Next Generation Pact that would use to support a replacement candidate. If Biden does not step aside, the money could be used to help down-ballot candidates, according to people close to the efforts. Supporters of potential replacements, like Kamala Harris, are jockeying to position their preferred successor. Other donors are threatening to withhold contributions not only from Biden, but from other Democratic groups, unless Biden bows out. Now, the reality is that the thing they really need to do is just bribe Biden to step out. Right, Joe Biden loves his money and his family loves the money. They actually need to come up with a slush fund and say, we're going to give you $100 million for your garbage presidential library in Wilmington, Delaware, where you can make Hunter Biden for a salary of $3 million a year, art curator and crack proprietor of the Biden presidential library. And then there'll be like a classroom on the side where Joe Biden can teach about the need for community college or something. And basically just create a retirement program for the entire Biden family. That is very, very lucrative. That's the only way to get that guy out. But- the donors are trying. Abigail Disney, who is an heir to the Disney fortune, said in an email exchange that Biden's campaign and committees supporting it will not receive another dime from me until they bite the bullet and replace Biden at the top of the ticket. Damon Lindelof, a Hollywood producer who's responsible for Lost, the worst series finale in television history. Damon Lindelof said in a text message, quote, no one is eager to donate to anyone until the proverbial dust settles. He is urging what he calls a dembargo of Biden and other Democratic candidates until Biden is replaced. Meanwhile, Reed Hastings, Netflix co-founder, he also is jumping on the bandwagon. He called on Wednesday for President Biden to relinquish his place atop the Democratic presidential ticket. He said Biden needs to step down and allow 
a vigorous Democratic leader to beat Trump and keep us safe and prosperous. So donors are starting to freak out as well. So again, the, the momentum seems to be with getting Joe Biden out of the race, but that could turn. That could turn. If Biden is even remotely alive tonight with George Stephanopoulos, if, if Stephanopoulos can massage some blood into Joe Biden's cheeks, like get up in the middle of the interview and pinch him on the cheeks to make him look alive or something. If that happens, then you could see all of the swivel. You could. They're already building the groundwork for that. We'll get to that in a moment. First, let's talk about some freedom, real freedom. This 4th of July weekend, Daily Wire Plus is not just celebrating freedom. We are giving it away. By one year of Daily Wire Plus, get one year free. That is correct. You get an additional year of the Ben Shapiro Show, plus all our daily shows uncensored, unfiltered, 100% ad-free. Get on-demand access to our full library of hit movies, groundbreaking documentaries, hard-hitting series, and investigative journalism that cuts through the noise. Plus, you can chat with me live on the Daily Wire Plus app during exclusive all-access events. This offer is unbeatable. It's incredibly simple. By one year of Daily Wire Plus, get one year free. Don't miss out on this opportunity to get informed, get entertained, join us as we fight the left and build the future. And meanwhile, the media, they are doing their best, some of them at least, to at least keep Joe Biden's flagging hopes alive. So the Associated Press ran what is one of the most astonishing headlines I've ever seen. This, this one is up there with CNN's fiery but mostly peaceful protests during the Black Lives Matter riots of 2020. Here is AP's headline, quote, Biden at 81, sharp and focused, but sometimes confused and forgetful. I'm gonna need a chart on that one. Sharp and focused, but sometimes confused and forgetful. <laughs> oh, boy. Good luck with that one. Good luck with that one. Meanwhile, my favorite attempt by Democrats to spin Joe Biden as, um, as still somewhat viable as a candidate. Some of President Biden's top donors have latched onto a Star Wars analogy aimed at keeping nervous supporters from defecting. President Biden is like Yoda, old and frail, yet wise and influential. Whereas Donald Trump is like Jabba the Hutt, a gluttonous and powerful gangster. Do you even movie, gang? I'm, that Those two characters don't even meet. The hell are you talking about? By the way, Yoda's a horrible example. Yoda loses to Palpatine. He proceeds to... Yoda destroys the Republic. I like Yoda. Yoda seems cool. But also, Yoda dies old and alone except for Luke after lying to Luke about his family's heritage for like his whole life. Like well, we are now at the end of Return of the Jedi. Yoda, like Luke has now returned to Dagobah and Yoda is curling up on that bed about to disappear, man. That is where we are. And what does that have to do with Jabba the Hutt? That's a completely different storyline. They're not even on the same planet. Jabba's on Tatooine and Yoda's on Dagobah. What the hell? Do you like... I thought these people are supposed to be Hollywood savvy. I will admit that, that that one is about as solid as the simile that was used by Jeffrey Katzenberg trying to massage Joe Biden back into life when he suggested that this race was like the race between Mufasa and Scar. Again, terrible job there. Do you even plot, bro? Mufasa ends up being trampled by wildebeest after Scar kills him. Scar literally sinks his claws into Mufasa's arms and causes him to fall down into a chasm where he is trampled by wildebeest. So well done there, Jeffrey Cass. Again, these people, wow. Wow, good luck. So in the end, Joe Biden's campaign has one thing and one thing only. And that, of course, is Donald Trump, which is why the Biden quick response headquarters tweeted on July 4th that what America would look like is, wait for it, the handmaid's tale. <sighs> First of all, the handmaid's tale, like this comparison went out of business like three years ago. When is the last time anyone made a Handmaid's Tale reference other than the far left? They tweeted out 4th of July under Trump's Project 2025, and it's a bunch of women from the Handmaid's Tale, and then, of course, the Washington Monument, which has been turned into a giant cross. So tiresome. Also really tiresome because it turns out that the 4th of July under actual Joe Biden is trying to make concessions to protesters who love people who stuff women into bags. I mean, that, that, like, that's actually Joe Biden's policy is to make concessions to Hamas and the Taliban and then to molly coddle the protesters who love those people, which is, by the way, what happened over the weekend, over the weekend in Democratic Party circles. They decided to celebrate July 4th on the radical left by burning American flags, which is what you do on July 4th. Here is some video of pro-Hamas protesters setting flags on fire on July 4th. These, these people are all prospective Biden voters. That's why he's attempting to reach out to them. This is July 4th in Biden's America. 
And then they are burning a poster of Donald Trump plus an American flag. Shouting free Palestine on behalf of Hamas. Look at these ridiculous geek morons. Seriously. Pathetic specimens. But these are all these are all prospective Biden voters, which is why he's been catering to them. Okay, that of course is not the only footage from July 4th. They also decided to march directly through New York City chanting genocidal slogans because this is this is what you do if you are a if you are a Joe Biden supporter on July 4th or perspective. They're only angry at him that he's not radical left enough. Meanwhile, he sees them as, you know, possible voters. These are just the, the voters he needs to get in his camp. So when he when his team is saying that July 4th looks like the handmaid's tale for Republicans, it doesn't. But this is what actual July 4th looks like for radical Democrats. So they're marching through New York City on July 4th to protest in favor of Hamas. They also um, disrupted some actual 4th of July celebrations just for good measure and chanted death to America. Again, July 4th in Joe Biden's America. So you can see people there with the American flag. And the protesters are screaming at them. Death to America. By the way, the people with the American flag, as always, pro-Israel supporters, as always. You notice something weird? You've never seen an American flag that's not being burned at a pro Hamas protest, ever, in history. That should tell you something about the political priors of the people who love Hamas and hate Israel on the left. And by the way, on the right. In any case, Joe Biden, he's going to blame his own voters if he is tossed from the race. Over the last 24 hours, he suggested if you sit it out, it's your fault. It's not his fault for being a crap candidate. It is your fault for not being enthusiastic enough about a dead person. What do you say to the people who plan on sitting this election out? Same thing that was said to me when I was a young kid getting out of school during the civil rights movement. If you don't do something about it, you're to blame. You're responsible. Okay, good, good luck with this particular. Hour. Meanwhile, Gavin Newsom, governor of California, who will not be the nominee. He's attempting to buy back all of the anti-Biden hatred by basically saying you have to vote for the corpse because orange Hitler. You talk a lot about this election being uh, night and day, lightness and darkness. What is that? Lightness Daylight and darkness. darkness. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, you, 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 pretty dystopian choice. You got Donald Trump wants to take us back to a pre-1960s world. He wants America in reverse. On voting rights, civil rights, LGBTQ rights. What, what, what a sad sack Gavin Newsom is. Yeah, low rent Gordon Gecko over there. Meanwhile, Donald Trump, he had some more twos on the golf course. And he's been spending... A lot of time on the golf course lately, probably to prove that uh, he actually does have a six handicap or whatever it is. I, I do have to say, again, the best tweet of the last year was from our friend Frank Fleming, who tweeted out that watching Donald Trump stay silent is eerie. It's like the scene in Jurassic Park where the velociraptor starts using the door handle. Like he's learning. He's learning. But he was caught on tape saying something true about Joe Biden. And, you know, it happens. The truth slips. How did I do with the debate the other night? Oh, yeah. oh amazing. amazing. That old broken down pile of crap. <laughs> yeah. It's a bad guy. He just quit, you know. He's quitting the rest. Is that right? Yep. I got him out of the rest. Well, and that means we have Kamala. Uh, I think she's going to be better. She's so bad. She's so pathetic. It's so amazing. It's just so bad. So. I just can't imagine. But can you imagine that guy with dealing with Putin and the president of China, who's a fierce person? He's a fierce man. Right. A very tough guy, and they see him. They probably they can't. But it, it, they just announced he's he's probably quitting. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. That's just keep knocking him out, right? Yeah, thank thank you. You. <laughs> By the way, that is the danger of being a very famous person: is that somebody is almost always filming you. Uh, so Donald Trump did put out a Fourth of July message, very inspiring Fourth of July message, I might add. "Quote: Why would anyone say he's cognitively challenged?" Also, respects to our potentially new Democrat challenger, laughing Kamala Harris. She did poorly in the Democrat nominating process, starting out at number two, ending up defeated and dropping out even before getting to Iowa. That doesn't mean she's not a highly talented politician. Just ask her mentor, the great Willie Brown of San Francisco. That is a reference to the fact that Kamala Harris got her start in politics by sleeping with the mayor of San Francisco, who was married at the time, who then appointed her to a bunch of government positions. Someone else that I have, comp I have to compliment is a deranged Biden prosecutor named Jack Smith who's become a legend in his own mind for all of those cases he has lost. The corrupt prosecutors are working hard for Crooked Joe, but it will never be enough. Make America great again. 
So again, like as we've been saying for a while, Donald Trump's best strategy in this in this entire process, just ixnay on the awking day. Just like let, let the Democrats be the Democrats. First rule of politics, don't interrupt your opponents while they are making a mistake. And Trump overall has held to that. Again, one of the great things that happened to Donald Trump, I've told this story before, I believe, but I, I visited the White House in, uh, in 2018 when Donald Trump was president. And I was asked you know, about how his presidency was going and what recommendations I would have. I said his executive policy was like an A minus, his legislative policy was a C plus. And I said, on rhetoric, man, he's not doing well. And they said, what would you do? I said, I would construct a fake Twitter. I would put it on his phone. And then the president of the United States would tweet and it would go nowhere. But there would be fake feedback that would make him super happy and no one would ever see his tweet. And he'd walk around in a really good mood and no one would ever see whatever he decided to tweet while he was on the toilet that day. And then it happened because Twitter banned him and he started Truth Social. And so he's on an outlet where basically there's no one but Trump and fans. And so it's kind of worked out fairly well for him. He puts out statements like that and nobody kind of notices them because. Eh. So that actually has worked out quite well. The well, bottom line is. Democrats, they need a new inflection point, which is why, again, tonight is it's going to be all about tonight. Can Joe Biden recover anything remotely like a semblance of a shred of support inside his own party? Time grows very short. If, if Joe Biden is not out of the race by the end of next week, Joe Biden is the nominee. They just don't have enough time to replace him after that, effectively speaking. So meanwhile, there are some danger signs across the water for the right. The danger signs are these. One, if the left ever moderates, if the left ever moderates, even like a shred, and the right continues to be incompetent, the left will win and they will do really, really well. That is the story over in the UK. It is not as though the Labour Party has done like an amazing job. The Labour Party is just magnificent. Everyone loves the Labour Party. It's that everyone is mad at the conservatives because the conservatives basically turned into the Labour Party. They decided to run and win on a platform that included Green New Deal type environmental nonsense, fairly open immigration, COVID lockdowns, like there was very little to distinguish the concert, the Tory party in the UK from labor, except that labor was run by Jeremy Corbyn, who was a total actual Soviet level nutcase. And then they replaced him with Keir Starmer and Keir Starmer decided to moderate his image, run as somebody who is at least somewhat rational, kind of like Gordon Brown or even Tony Blair, run more toward the center rather than to the far left. And so last night in the UK, Labor won an overwhelming victory, worst loss for the conservatives in 190 years in the UK. Despite the fact that, again, a lot of the ire is on the right. Because what the poll results show is that conservatives in the UK actually did win a fairly solid plurality of the votes. The conservatives won, this is the Tory party, won 23.7% of the vote. The Reform Party, which is 14.3, that's Nigel Farage's party, won like 4 million votes. The conservatives won 6.8 million votes, which means in total, conservative and reform, which are the right wing in the UK, represent approximately 38% of the vote compared to labor, which represents approximately 33.8% of the vote. The Liberal Democrats, kind of a moderate left party, they won 12.2% of the vote. And then you have the other kind of fraction, fractional parties. Labor won a little bit more than one third of the vote, and they're going to end up with one of the largest majorities in the history of Great Britain with 412 seats out of the possible 600 or so seats in the in the legislature in the UK, in the House of Commons. So the new prime minister is a guy named Keir Starmer. And Keir Starmer is, again, a sort of more moderate laborite. The only reason that was allowed to happen is exactly because they did not move in the Jeremy Corbyn direction. That is a reminder for both Democrats and Republicans. If Democrats ever swivel to the left, they're going to lose until the end of time. And if Republicans ever moderate, not in terms of policies so to become leftists, but ever appear reasonable and rational, which is something Donald Trump has actually been trying to do in this election cycle, then they will do well. Again, everyone just wants normalcy. Everything is so crazy right now. Everyone wants normalcy. The conservatives in the UK seemed crazier than labor, which is wild, but it is true. And so labor ends up winning a massive victory over in the UK. The same thing seems to be happening a little bit in France, in France, Marine Le Pen is, she, her party is certainly going to be the biggest party in the legislature. However, the quote unquote moderate party of Emmanuel Macron, his centrist alliance, is now working with the new popular front coalition, which is the communists in France, in order to thwart Marine Le Pen. 
According to Bloomberg, a final push by parties intent on keeping Marine Le Pen's far-right national rally out of power gained momentum ahead of Sunday's legislative election as key political figures warn voters their decision would dramatically alter France and potentially lead to chaos. So basically, the argument that is being made by Macron is that Le Pen is a bridge too far. Now, will the French public listen? They should not. They obviously should not. But that is always the argument against the right, is that they're too radical. Now, I do think that Le Pen has done a good job of taking herself sort of the back bench a little bit and letting Jordan Bardella, who is the 28-year-old, lead the party publicly because he is actually quite camera-friendly and good at his job. However, the attempt, it shows you where the center is. It shows you that the center in France is actually with the left. They would prefer to caucus with the communists than to caucus with the anti-immigration right. The reason that that's a bit of a warning sign for Trump is that if the left ever moderates and is not totally crazy, then the possibility of them winning an election is still quite plausible. That will be the move, by the way. If they replace Joe Biden with Kamala Harris, Kamala Harris is going to swivel to the center, not to the far left. She's going to assume that she's got the far left locked up and she's going to swivel back toward the center. And then it's a completely different race. In just a second, we'll get to some fascinating data on July 4th weekend about patriotism in the United States. As always, the lie that the left likes to tell about the right is that the right is anti the country. Actually, we have the poll statistics and ain't true. It's the opposite. If you're not a member, become a member. Use code Shapiro. Check out for two months free on all annual plans. Click that link in the description and join us.